Well, good morning to you. Welcome to church. Today we have a guest speaker, Clinton Montgomery, speaking of the Spirit's gift to us of the power of choice. Looking forward to that. See you soon. Welcome to church. My name is Clinton and uh, I'll be preaching this week on the power of choice. Um, really trusting that Pat and uh, that Pat would have a great time away on leave. It's such a privilege just to get some time away and uh, really praying for them that this would be a time of rest and uh, just recovering after a really interesting 2020 heading into 2021. I read a very interesting verse out of Job 33 verse 4, where um, Job comes and remember this is uh, chronologically the first book that was ever written. Where Job comes and he says, The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. It's so interesting, sometimes we think that God's Spirit was just in play at Pentecost, not realizing that even Job, writing one of the first books of the Bible, considered this as a part of his creation reality. That the Spirit of God made him, and the breath of God gave him life. Sometimes we run the risk of thinking about um, God in terms of Father, Son, and Holy Scriptures. Not thinking about the fact that the Spirit was such an integral part of the um, creation reality. And an integral part of everything that happened from creation right up until the day that we're living in today. So thinking about this, I want to sort of just um, consider a few thoughts when it comes to the effect that the Spirit of God has in our daily lives. I love what Pat says, that, that when it comes to the Spirit, it can range between cold and crazy. And somewhere in the middle, there has to be a, a, a living reality that affects our daily lives, our daily livings. I firmly believe that God's Spirit is not just for the big moments, the big events in life, the salvation and, and some of those. It's, it's for every day. It defines the big moments and the small moments in such a beautiful way. Listen to what Paul says in Romans 8 verse 1 to 4. He says, So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. That's um, the foundational reference. And because you belong to Him, the power of the life-giving Spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our own sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent His own Son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving His Son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us, who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. And I think that's probably one of the things that we need to consider living um, this Christ life in the Monday to, to Saturday experience. What does it look like? What does it mean for us to follow the Spirit, to walk in step with God's Spirit, to allow His Spirit to sort of guide the big and the small decisions we make in everyday life. Paul makes a very interesting statement. He says that in the body of Christ, God declared an end 
to sin's control over us. Maybe that's something that you need to reflect on right now. Just to consider in the basic decisions, the little interactions that you have with yourself every day. Just asking yourself the question, in what way does sin still control you? Or are you led? Are you guided? Are you inspired by the Spirit's presence in, in your life? Viktor Frankl, um, a Jewish psychologist that was caught up in the um, uh, uh, concentration camps in, in the Second World War, uh, brought us a very interesting reference when it comes to choice. He said, we need to realize that there's a big difference between us and animals. That animals don't have the power to choose. They just go by impulse. Um, and they go by what they learn and control. But we have this big um, uh, capacity to consider that between what we are stimulated by and our response, we have the ability to choose. That we're not guided by the stimulus. That there's something different in humanity that in the moment that we're stimulated by, either positive or negative, that we have that capacity to stand still for a moment and to consider just what our response would be. Now, many of us don't think about it that way. We're very reactive and sometimes we're stimulated and we react either in anger or in frustration or sometimes in, in sinful and, and, and damaging ways and that's not helpful. So thinking about this, Paul addresses this in Galatians 5 verse um, 16 to 26 where he starts by saying, let the Holy Spirit guide your life. Just think about that. Paul assumes that God's Spirit would be involved in the daily interactions, in the little things that we sort of engage in, in making our lives work. He says, let the Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. I think it's important to realize that, that, that there's something inside of, it, inside of us, something that was conditioned to sort of follow after the pathway of this, these sinful impulses that wants to destroy, it wants to kill, it wants to bring devastation, and the end result of that is always ugly. But there's a part of what God brings to your life, and it's that part that was sort of initiated when the power of sin was broken our, over our lives, and, and that's where the Spirit leads us, Contrary to what our sinful nature wants to, to guide us into. He says the sinful nature wants to do evil, which is the opposite of what the Spirit wants. The Spirit gives us desires that are opposite to what the sinful nature desires. Have you ever thought about it? That God's Spirit in you, guiding you, actually gives you desires of things that are good, things that are pleasant. And desire is an interesting thing. Desire is a key motivator. So God's Spirit actually gives you the capacity to desire, a motivation, an inspiration from the inside that has the same pulling power, sometimes bigger than what sin would do. And that's one of the things that I want you to consider. Maybe just asking you at the moment, we all know and we can all define the desires that our sinful nature brings. But have you ever thought about the fact that God wants to lead you through desires that His Spirit has placed in you? He says, these two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you, you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. That obligation has been broken. So we don't do this Christian life out of obligation. We're desire driven. We're led by desires that the Spirit breathes into us. He says, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are clear. It's sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. He says, let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. There is a separation. There is a distinctiveness in the way that we do life because we are led by the Spirit, not led by our sinful nature. He continues in verse 22. He says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, 
patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. He says that there is no law against these things. And those who belong to Christ have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to the cross and crucified them there. Listen to what he says. He, they nailed their sinful nature and sinful passions to the cross. That doesn't mean we're not living with, with, without passion or without desires. It's just we've nailed the wrong passions and the wrong desires to the cross. We are now set free to live with the power of passion and the power of desire. Actually following hard after what God is calling us into. He says, since we are living by the Spirit... Let us follow the Spirit leading in every part of our lives. What does it look like for us to, to follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives? Well, um, to unpack further what Frankel sort of suggested, he said, Between stimulus and response, we've got this capacity to choose. And we draw on four different capacities. Our self-awareness, which is your perception of your identity informs your choice so so think about this every time you choose you are giving people an indication of your perception of your identity the second thing that we draw on is our conscience which is your perception of your past that every time you choose you sort of give people an indication of are you fueled by guilt shame or pain Or is your conscience something that has been cleaned? Um, Are you doing something from an innocence, a a pureness of heart, which is again reflected in your choices? The third one, which is really interesting, is that every time you choose, you're giving people um, and yourself an indication on your perception of your future. That some people's imaginations have been so screwed by just falling into fantasies of, 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 of lust and, and sin and different things that they don't understand that their imagination is actually the capacity to live by faith. The ability to see the future. The ability to walk forward in hope. And, and if that part of your world, that part of your life, if your imagination has been destroyed, you lose hope. And you can't place hope at the center of the choices that you make. And the last one is your independent will. It's the perception of your ability to act. Can you, be, um, can you cause something to, to happen? Can you act when needed? And some people's ability to act has been so, um, uh, uh, so hurt that when the key moments in life come, they, draw, they need to draw upon their independent will, but it's been, um, it's been stagnated because of fear or because of just um, that hopelessness that doesn't exist anymore. And all of these things are seen in our choices when we respond to the way that we are stimulated. And, and, and maybe just let's ask the question. If you think about this, what is seen at this moment in terms of your self-awareness, your conscience, your imagination, and your independent will in the choices that you are making. What are the people closest to you thinking when they see your choices, the way that you are acting? Are you led by the Spirit? Or have you been held hostage by a wrong perception of identity, your past, your future, and your ability to act? Now, these things are quite easy in the black and white decisions um, where it's clear. I think the Bible gives us a list. Don't kill, don't steal, don't um, uh, commit adultery. There's um, quite a, 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 um, I think, a clear list on what we are allowed and what we aren't allowed to do. But when I thought about this, I asked myself the question, how do we choose in gray areas where it's not as clear? See, Viktor Frankl speaks about the principle of having integrity in the moment of choice. That when these choices come where it's not black and white, it's not those easy decisions in life. I don't wake up in the mornings thinking, okay, um, I know I want to kill someone, but I'm not going to. I don't live like that. But there are those great decisions, those decisions that, that they're neither black or white. 
that we need to have integrity in the moment of choice where we allow God's Spirit to lead us into the unknown, sometimes without all the information we need. And I actually think um, Paul speaks clearly on this in the book of Corinthians, where he gives us five principles to consider every time we need to make decisions in gray areas. The first one he speaks about is the principle of grace. Does it lead to freedom or bondage? 1 Corinthians 6 verse 12 in the message translation, Paul says, Just because something is technically legal doesn't mean that it is spiritually appropriate. If I went around doing whatever I thought I could get by with, I'd be a slave to my whims or my impulses. That we've got to consider the principle of grace. In the decisions that I'm making, will it lead to freedom or bondage? I've got a real problem with condensed milk. Um, that I can't, um, I don't have the capacity to, to say no to a tin of condensed milk. And I don't, I don't share with anyone. It's mine. Um, so I would buy a tin of condensed milk, condensed milk and every time I buy it, I know it's wrong. Because there's a certain reaction afterwards where I get this major sugar rush. And straight after, <laughs> I can't, I, I've got to go to bed. I'm no good. And I realize that I don't consider the principle of grace every time I walk past that aisle and I take a tin of condensed milk. Because it's going to lead me into the bondage of sleep <laughs> um, if, if I take that. And, and that's just a light um, uh, example. But, but we do that. In the way we engage the um, kind of entertainment that we allow in our lives, the emotional reactions or outbursts that we allow, the sinful habits that we allow, have you asked yourself the question, does this lead to freedom or bondage? The second principle is the principle of growth. Does it build me up or does it break me down? 1 Corinthians 10 verse 23, Paul says, All things are lawful, that is morally legitimate and permissible, but not all things are beneficial or advantageous. All things are lawful, but not all things are constructive to character and edifying to spiritual life. See, as you grow in maturity, you realize, even uh, just as an adult, that life doesn't consist between the white and the black. Life consists in living well in the gray. And you've got to ask yourself the question, in certain things that you allow to form your character and to edify your spiritual life, that is it building me up or is it actually breaking me down? That there's certain things that doesn't always classify just as sin. But in doing that, it, with, it makes withdrawals out of your character and out of things that edifies your spiritual life. And in time, it will affect you. The third principle is the principle of conscience. Where, where, where we've got to ask the question, does my decisions trigger guilt and shame? Or can I glorify God through what I'm about to do? 1 Corinthians 10 verse 31 to 33 says, Whether you eat or drink, live your lives in a way that glorifies and honors God. That's pretty straightforward. Whatever you do, even in the basics of eating and drinking, live your life in a way that brings glory to God. And make sure that you're not offending Jews or Greeks. Don't offend the religious or irreligious or any part of God's assembly over your personal preferences. Then he comes and he says, follow my example. For I try to please everyone in all things rather than putting my liberty first. It's so interesting um, that how often immaturity is a sign of us, um, or putting ourselves first is a sign of immaturity. He says, I sincerely attempt to do anything I can so that others may be saved. Does your decisions trigger guilt, shame, or pain, or does it glorify God in what you are doing in the small basic interactions of life? The fourth one, the principle of others. Am I acting for my own benefit, or am I considering others in my decisions? Um, 1 Corinthians 10, 23 and 20 to 24, Paul says, looking at it one way, you could say, anything goes. Because of God's immense generosity and grace, we don't have to dissect and scrutinize every action to see if it will pass muster. But the point is not just to get by. We want to live well. Jesus speaks of the fact that He wants us to live abundantly. Uh, he says, um, because we want to live well, our foremost efforts 
should be to help others live well. If you look at your own life, and again, ask the question, um, considering people closest to you, are they seeing in you an example worth following? Are you always acting for your own benefit, or are you considering others in your decisions? The last one is, will my behavior attract non-believing people to Christ, or will it push them away? 1 Corinthians 10.33 says, Don't be callous, callous in your exercise of freedom, thoughtlessly stepping on the toes of those who aren't as free as you are. He says, I try my best to be considerate of everyone's feelings in all these matters, and I hope you will be too. See, see there's, um, I think, just this reference that we need to consider. Joel speaks about the fact that there's a multitude of people in the valley of decisions, that decisions have the capacity to affect your life in such an eternal way that the decisions you make in this life affects the life that you'll experience in the next life. Paul speaks in Romans 14 where he says, if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. And he says in 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10 that the reality of our decisions that we need to give account to God for all that we've done in this life. He says that there will be a day where we would stand before Christ to give account of these decisions and we will each receive whether we deserve the good or bad that we have done on earth. And I think it's something worth considering. Just if you take the sum total of your decisions, you're actually giving us a great reflection of your perception of who you are. And I want to conclude just with how C.S. Lewis just spoke about the need for great decisions. He says, good and evil both increase at compound interest. That is why the little decisions you and I make every day are of such infinite importance. The smallest good act today is the capture of a strategic point from which a few months later you may be able to go on to victories you never dreamed of. An apparently trivial trivial indulgence in lust or anger today is the loss of a ridge or railway line or a bridgehead from which the enemy can launch an attack that is otherwise impossible. And all of that intersects in the small decisions of life. It's my prayer that you would experience God's leading through His Spirit in the small interaction, the basic decisions that you need to make on a daily basis. Don't ever forget that God's Spirit is an ever-present reality wanting to guide you in everything you do. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you that um, we can just consider the fact that you want to be involved in our lives, in in the big and the small, the basic decisions and those life-defining decisions. Thank you, Lord, that when we consider the fact that our decisions actually shape our future, that you've not left us alone, but you've given us your spirit to guide us, to lead us, uh, your spirit so that we could follow uh, in, 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 in the every interday interactions. And Father, I want to pray that you would lead us through your spirit in a way that would astound us. I want to pray, Lord, for a deeper awareness of your spirit in, in the basics of life for young and old. And that we would realize even in the moments where things look gray, that you are willing to guide us, willing to lead us into life and an abundant life. In Jesus' name, Amen.